Well, hello, and welcome to Hey Boomer. My name is Wendy Green, and I am your host for Hey Boomer. And at Hey Boomer, we are changing the conversation about getting older. Rather than seeing it as declining, we see it as the opening of a potentially exciting new and vibrant chapter, a time for exploration, self-discovery, and learning. And happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. How interesting that our discussion of a historical event and its impact on us falls on a day when we remember other historical events that also had enormous impact on our society. So today we're continuing on our theme of family dynamics and the relationships today we are talking about with Dean King, the author of The Feud, The Hatfields and McCoys, The True Story. Dean has done research and the story of The Feud is spelled out in detail. He had to include several family trees within the book so the reader could keep up with the family members who were still living and which family members had been killed during the feud. It also is not as simple as being a Hatfield or McCoy. Members of the families intermarried, which complicated the animosities even more. The feud is a story of families and revenge and politics and brutality. And we'll spend some time with Dean learning about the story. Things like what started the feud? How long did it last? What were some of the mitigating factors that kept it going? How did it impact not only the families, but the American society? And then we'll dissect some of the lessons that could be learned from these events. Because isn't it always best to learn from history rather than repeat it? Hmm. Before we do, get ready to embark on an incredible journey with us by becoming a boomer believer. And welcome to our newest boomer believer, Dr. Barbara Kaufman. What's in store for you as a boomer believer? Well, you will be able to join a monthly Zoom meeting with incredible Hey Boomer guests. And this month, it's going to be Dean King. You'll be able to join the monthly Boomer banter sessions where we find friendship, insights, learning, have great times. You'll get to sport your Hey Boomer pride with a special edition ball cap. You'll get a shout out on the podcast to celebrate you as a new member, like I just did for Barbara Kaufman. And you'll get special birthday recognition because you deserve it. So mark your calendars for the inaugural Boomer Believer event on January 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll get to talk and ask questions and learn from Dean King about the Hatfields and McCoys. Join us as a Boomer Believer for just $25 a month, and you can... Sign up for this first one if you want to talk to Dean. And if you decide you don't want to continue, there is no obligation. So don't miss out on this unique opportunity to connect, engage, and learn with and support the Hey Boomer community. All right. You ready to meet Dean? Hi, Dean. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great, great to be here. Love to talk well, about history. I know. I'm excited about what we're going to talk about. Let me do a brief introduction, and then we'll jump right in. So Dean King is an award-winning author of 10 nonfiction books. Dean relishes the adventure involved in making history come to life, while at the same time diligently searching out the truth and turning up new historical detail. While researching his national bestseller, Skeletons on the Zahara, he crossed the Sahara on camels and in Land Rovers. He trekked the Long March Trail in the snowy mountains of Western China while researching Unbound and was shot at in Appalachia while writing The Feud. For his most recent book, Guardians of the Valley, Dean traveled to John Muir's boyhood homes in Dunbar, Scotland, and rural Wisconsin, 
and spent months roaming Yosemite National Park and the Sierra Nevada. That sounds amazing, Dean. I would have loved to be out there in Yosemite and learning all that. But I want to jump right in. Okay, you ready? Ready to go. All right. Chapter two starts by defining what a feud is. You write a blood feud in the vein of the Hatfields versus the McCoys or the Montagues against the Capulets of Shakespeare fame is essentially a state of warfare between two families. Feuds do not always have neat beginnings and endings. And such was the case in the Hatfield and McCoy feud. It seems there were potentially three starting points of the feud, politics, theft, theft and love. Would you talk about those? Yeah, you know, um, feuds can take many different forms and have many different factors. Uh, and um, I always like to say they're not logical. You know, they're, they're inherently emotional. And uh, in this case, um, you know, they're, 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 there's been historical debate about what started the Hatfield-McCoy feud, when it started. And, and for me, uh, as I studied it, I saw uh, several events and I like to pr pride myself as being the master of the one match fire. I learned it in Boy Scouts. I can light a campfire <laughs> with one match. But but I think this fire, the you know, the metaphorical fire of the feud was lit from three different spots. You can still do it with one match, but you don't just light one spot. And and the, the, so there was the, 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 the politics, the civil war that, that was a big factor. And and then there was a, a love affair that that brought the two families, uh, made them them clash, you know, kind of a matter of honor. Um, and then there was um, there was shooting and, and murder <laughs> that that also uh, was part of it. So and that, um, that was political, too. Right. A lot of the shooting and murder. Sure. And in and, and, and the, and the theft was an argument over a, a hog, um, which seems trivial. But, you know, if we get into it a little bit, you'll see that the, a hog was in a very important thing, you know, at that place at that time. And so uh, the, the, the matter of the ownership of this particular hog uh, became uh, another flashpoint. Hmm. So you talk a lot about the two patriarchs, Devil Ants Hatfield and Randall McCoy. Can you kind of go through their relationship? Because they started, I think, as friends, right? Yeah. And one of the um, fascinating aspects of this feud, I think, is that in 1848, we're talking about um, the, the Tug River Valley, which um, straddles the West for now West Virginia, Kentucky border. At the time, it was Virginia and Kentucky. Um, and then that part of Virginia was would secede from Virginia during the Civil War and become West Virginia. But uh, so the Hatfields and McCoys lived peacefully together in the Tug River Valley uh, during the first half of the 19th century. They were so close. They intermarried. They did business together. And they actually petitioned the government of Virginia and said, hey, look, this is this this is one community here in the Tug River Valley. And you've got a state line through here that's dividing us. Really, um, you should make the whole Tug River Valley part of Virginia. And mm -hmm. Hatfields and McCoys both signed this petition. And so um, it, it, it never got passed. But if that petition had gotten passed, I, I believe there never would have been a Hatfield McCoy feud. Um, yeah. But, and, and, and then I, th I think that speaks then to the friendship of, of Devil Ants Hatfield and Randall McCoy. I mean, these families were inherently close knit. They came from the, you know, similar places. They understood each other. The, when the war, the civil war broke out uh, because the state line went right through there, um, it would it would start to complicate things. It's funny, you know, when you get back from history, you like to have everything black and white and work really well. <laughs> Nothing works well in the feud. No explanation <laughs> is clean and simple because yeah. you you had the, the the state lines. It didn't separate the McCoys on the Union side and the Hatfields on the um, Confederate side. All the Hatfields and McCoys on the Kentucky side, which was neutral for the first year, eventually fought for the Union. All the uh, Hatfields and McCoys on the Confederate, on the West Virginia side, the Virginia side, even though it would secede and become West Virginia part of the Union, they stayed with the South, except wow. for Randall McCoy, who grew up in West Virginia but lived on the Kentucky side. And um, he fought for the Confederacy with Devil Ants Hatfield. And so, um, you know, these guys uh, fought on the same side in the war and ran in the, in the same group. So, um, 
you know, again, feuds are irrational and they're emotional. And, and it's often, as, as people probably know, um, when families, when things fall apart on families, it can be extra heated because they're families and because they're close in, you know, and have deep seated um, animosity potentially. Um, and, and I think that's what sort of uh, exploded here was was that these these families were so close that they even raided each other during the Civil War and um, and, and it created great uh, passionate anger. So if they were so close, what happened? And if they fought on the same side, what happened? Well, Randall fought on the same side as the, with Devil Lance, but one of his brothers fought for the Union. And the, the, um, the Hatfields came across into Kentucky uh, at the end of the war and killed that brother, uh, Harmon McCoy. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, you know, uh, that, that, of course, would... Um, create some issues for, for Randall, though nothing happened immediately. And that's part of why there's questions as to, was that the beginning of the feud? Well, there, there wasn't an, an immediate follow-up to that. Um, and, and also brings me back to my sort of three, three flame beginnings of a fire. That was one. But um, also typical with feuds is there's not necessarily an immediate reaction. Frequently, what will happen is that an event will take place uh, maybe a family's honor is, is affected, and it will be the sons uh, or the sons and daughters of that family who will later attack back to try to regain their honor. And so it may take years for them to grow up. And and this feud took place over a period from the Civil War to 1890 and a little beyond, but there was a major event in 1890 that um, effectively uh, ended the feud. But, you know, so you had several generations affected, different, different, many different reasons for being a part of it or not. And, yeah. and today, today you have you have a similar effect. You still have some animosity there, but you have Hatfields and McCoys who are marrying now as they married back then during the feud because they were big families and they had um, different different feelings and in, in, in goals. And um, uh, so it's very complex. But there was also big flashpoints. At, at the election gatherings. Can you talk about what brought those on? Uh, yes, and, and I, I want to want mention one thing before we move on, apropos of that last question, was that um, one thing I discovered that had been unknown you know, in my, in my research was that uh, Randall McCoy's son, Jim, worked in Devil Ants' moonshining operation mm-hmm. and, um, and told a newspaper reporter uh, a New York newspaper reporter that back in the day, it got run in a big uh, section of the newspaper, but then had been basically lost to history. So again, that complexity here, here, you know, uh, uh, for your question, that here's a son that was working, you know, one of Randall's sons working for Dell Lance. Um, and, and, and then you have a series of events. Uh, so, you know, West Virginia, this part of Kentucky are very hilly, very remote, um, beautiful places. But, um, you, you know, a lot of verticality, hard, hard scrabble land, hard to work. There's there's coal there. There's uh, and, and people were scratching a living out of farming and um, hunting. But uh, so it was Election Day that brought them out of the mountains from their from their pretty much full time work to to do pretty much everything else, which was to, you know, to socialize, to court, um, to elect officials and, and to celebrate. Also, when the celebrate celebration carried on too long, um, there was drunkenness, there was fighting. And so you got the full gamut of, of human activity right there in one day. And they would cross over, right? So like the election might have been in Kentucky, but the Hatfields from West Virginia would still come over for that election day. Isn't that That's right? That's right. Yeah. And there again, you know, it really was kind of one big community. Uh, there was Devil Ants Hatfield on the West Virginia side. And there was preacher Ants Hatfield on the Kentucky side. He had kin there right where the elections took place. So they wanted to visit. You know, it was natural. Um, Some would say that the Hatfields came over to intimidate the McCoys at times and to, though they couldn't vote in Kentucky, to influence the vote But as the animosity heated up. But, um, you know, in one case, you had Devil Ants' son, Johnsey, who saw one of Randall McCoy's daughters who, who he thought was uh, quite attractive, and and they kind of snuck off and and started uh, an affair. 
Um, and that would be one of the flashpoints of the feud. Um, he took her back to, to West Virginia. Randall was incensed that um, his daughter was there unmarried, uh, living in the house with, with uh, uh, Randall Hatfield, Randall and his wife, uh, Vicey Hatfield. And so, you know, uh, that, that was one in incident. A little later, uh, a couple of years later, there was uh, an argument over an unpaid debt. Three McCoy sons who were angry over um, what had happened with their sister, with John C. Hatfield, <clears throat> then picked a fight with um, uh, Elias uh, Hatfield, um, Elias's brother, a, a Civil War hero, uh, stepped up, Ellison stepped in sort of took up the fight for him and ended up fighting the three McCoy boys who stabbed him multiple times and eventually shot him. I can, can tell you the rest of that tale, but that's just, you know, one of the, another of the flashpoints there that happened on an election day. Yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. And it sounded to me from my reading of it, that the, the moonshine had an awful lot to do with how the tempers got out of control and yeah. As it will do. <laughs> yeah. And then what happened to those McCoy brothers was pretty brutal. Um, so that takes me to this next question, though, where the book does seem to portray the revenge killings by the Hatfields to be much more brutal and grievous than the McCoys. Hence the well, killing of the McCoy brothers and the ambush on Randall's family and the killing of his daughter and son and the beating of his wife. Is that true? And if if that's true, where was the law in all of this? Yeah, I think the 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 incident where the the McCoys um, uh, stabbed Ellison Hatfield so many times was uh, more the anomaly. I mean that that, that of course was a, a violent, awful event. But um, the, the Hatfields generally had the upper hand. They had a little more wealth and a little more firepower. Again. Um, where we like to, we would love for the lines to be very cleanly drawn. Uh, Devil Ants Hatfield uh, had a timber operation, and he had McCoys working for him. And so sometimes McCoy, McCoys were doing his biting, which uh, you know would would make uh, the McCoys very upset and angry about that that their own um, family members were on the other side. But uh, this was a, a very remote area. It still is very remote. Um, but back in, in that day, there weren't there weren't state troopers who would come would come in. They had justices of the peace who were elected. You know, pre Preacher Ants Hatfield was uh, one of those uh, justices of the peace on the Kentucky side. There was a, a, a Hatfield who was the justice of the peace on the West Virginia side. So you can see these two families had a lot of, of power in the, in the area. They also had uh, political power. They could, they could swing the polls for a governor. So no governor is going to send somebody down there to, to fight against his people even if they're doing maybe something bad uh, in, in Kentucky, they're not going to send uh, a law enforcement down there to try to rectify that situation because it's a no-win situation for them. There, there just wasn't, you know, uh, because it was so remote, there, there wasn't any law enforcement. So these people, you, you know, they were frontiersmen and women, and they, they grew up there. They were self-reliant. Uh, they knew how to stick up for themselves. They had very strong feelings. And they were courageous and weren't, af weren't afraid to defend themselves. So why do you think this got picked up by like news in New York and became like a national story and, and eventually the bounty hunters came in? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it was even an international story at the same time uh, during this period, you had Jack the Ripper uh, committing his murders in London and you'll see some international papers where there's a Jack the Ripper headline and a Hatfield McCoy headline. And, and I think it played well to the international press who could go, that's what an American is. You know, these hill people living, they were very distinctive and, you know, making moonshine and shooting. It was easy, easy to characterize them that way. Unfair, of course. The New York media did nothing to mitigate that. They went in there and played that up because it, it made big headlines, it, it brought in readers. And really, uh, you know, a watershed moment was when the Hatfields decided, um, the, the McCoys, Randall McCoy had gone to a, a, a cousin of his, and uh, a guy named Perry Klein, who was an attorney in Pikeville, Kentucky, and told him what was going on. And Perry Klein had had an altercation with Devil Ants Hatfield already over some property that he owned, that he had inherited in his family, that Devil Ants managed, managed to take away. So he was very prone to sticking up for the McCoys and to fighting for them. 
And the Hatfields thought, boy, they're going to bring the law down on us. This is going to be a problem. We need to end this uh, feud right now. Let's go get Randall. And so they sent a group over on New Year's Day in, in eight, uh, 1890 and attacked the house, uh, burned it, and, and during the shooting, killed uh, Alifair, one of Randall and, and Sally McCoy's daughters. And, and that made big headlines. You know, before it was men shooting at each other, it wasn't that uncommon in the day. You had the Wild West going on and, and shootouts and feuds in, in the Appalachian, some more bloody than this one. But um, once an innocent young woman was killed, uh, it, it became a, sort of a different beast. The New York City uh, papers sent reporters in there, and they were very talented reporters. They, they went in there, and, and they really reported deeply and, and, and produced some of our best raw material, yet it was also stigmatized the families in the area. The people in West Virginia and Kentucky are rightly still angry about the condescending nature of some of these reports, yet it is some of the most accurate reporting in terms of the action that we have. I want to, um, I'm going to take us into the present, but I want to do a little quick word from our sponsor, Road Scholar, who offers amazing travel experiences for boomers and beyond, as well as grandparent and grandchild trips, which I have been on a few. Um, altogether, I've been on four Road Scholar trips in the past two years, and each one has been exceptional. Road Scholar has trips to all 50 states and over 100 countries, and you can find them at roadroadscholar.org slash heyboomer. Here it is, roadroadscholar.org slash heyboomer. So please go and support our sponsor and love your travel with Road Scholar. Okay, so I want to bring us now a little bit more into the present, Dean. So the feud officially, uh, not officially, unofficially ended around 1890 with a hanging. Is that right? That's correct. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, um, at that time, you got to remember, um, this is the the Reconstruction has ended in the South after the Civil War. You have it's the age of industrialization. Um, you have the railroads connecting the nation, and then all of a sudden, you you have uh, Northeasterners who are very interested in the energy assets in West Virginia and Kentucky, the coal, and you have locals who are also interested in <clears throat> making money off off the coal. And so uh, the, the Northeastern industrialists are coming in, buying up the land uh, before a lot of the, the locals know its true value um, unfairly. And this is still, a, you know, an issue that's with us today. But um, locals also knew that these guys weren't going to be able to come in and extract that coal, coal if, they, if they believed that it was a lawless place, that murder was going on, and that there was havoc and chaos. And so they wanted to end the feud. And so because of there had been raids back and forth across the West Virginia, Kentucky line, Perry Klein had gone and gotten a Kentucky governor to come and get involved. The West Virginia governor had gotten involved. They, they both sent militias down to the area, nearly had a border war between two, you know, states that were on opposite sides in the Civil War. Uh, and so it could have potentially reignited the Civil War right there. You know, there, 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 were, there, there were political reasons for this not being straightened out. And so um, you would have a posse go over, a Kentucky posse came over into West Virginia and raided and killed somebody and, you know, back and forth. And so it, it was it was basically a mess. But and, and so really um, there was a, a arrests of some Hatfields. One of them um, was made a sacrificial lamb. Uh, he was convicted of the of the killing of Alifair in that um, house raid. And, and he, you know, they, they put up gallows. There were supposed to be no more public hangings at this time. You know, those, had, those had, were a thing of the past, supposedly. So they built a fence around it low enough that you could see from the hills above to see. They made a big spectacle for the media to come. And everybody came to see it to show that the Hatfield-McCoy feud is ending. But, but they were still scared that Devil Ants might ride in with his, with his posse and and um, rescue uh, the the guy who was was to be hung, and so um, <clears throat> there was a lot of law enforcement and militia in Pikeville at the time. 
but so that was uh he did not do that um there was the the, the hanging and that that uh pretty much ended the feud though you know there there would still be tit for tat and, and the feelings never went away and that has sort of continued on to this day well and you mentioned that um Continuing on to this day, there is actually a reality show out now, right? Called the Hatfields and McCoys Forever Feuding. That's right. The, the real <laughs> Hatfields and McCoys Forever Feuding. <laughs> are they still feuding? Um, they are in a different way. You know, it, it's it's uh, more economic this today, whereas it was, it was very male-driven back then. You have women who are, are big players in the, the, you know, sort of hostilities now. And, and so, you know, there are McCoys who are, um, you know, in, in the first season of, of this uh, uh, this follow doc, we call it, where you're following real people. Um, it, it is uh, Courtney McCoy setting up a restaurant and, and hospitality um, site uh, to to attract ATV riders who ride on the Hatfield McCoy trails. Tourism is very big there now. Um, but she she's actually in Logan, West Virginia, which is traditionally Hatfield country and very close to where uh, a big group of Hatfields who also cater to the ATV trails are. And so, you know, it, it is, it has set up some, some ill feelings. There's, they're still making um, spirits. Uh, they're starting uh, hospitality of uh, another hotel. The, the Hatfields are starting a hotel and, and you, so you have, have these bitter feelings. These are, um, these are ambitious, smart people. They're in this incredible environment. And it's actually very fun to see them sort of try to outwit each other. That's what they're doing now. There's no shootings now. They're just trying to outmaneuver so that they can run each other out of business. Pretty much. Yeah, they're still, <laughs> they're still have, heavily armed, but they're still intermarrying. You know, mm -hmm. in the first season, there's a marriage between the Hatfield and McCoy. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's some bitterness over the fact that the wedding takes, takes place at the McCoy's place and not the Hatfield site. And so um, they still compete when they're out hunting. Um, if, if you tune in to uh, the second season, which will be out this spring on Fox Nation, uh, you'll see that there's a competition on who can kill the biggest buck and there's a bet. And so, the, you know, a, a lot of the things that you would have seen back in the day have not changed. They're still very rural. Uh, they're, they're still very much attached to the land. Uh, they're still very proud. They're still very armed. Um, I should say that there was an official peace treaty that was signed uh, between the Hatfields and McCoys. So that's one thing that has changed. Yeah. And your role in this in this ongoing series on Fox Nation, what is that? I, I'm actually a, a producer and an on-air historian. So um, uh, Fox Nation loves this history, as do the Hatfields and McCoys. And, and so... Um, I appear on the show at certain times to sort of connect what's going on today to the the history that took place and to make parallels and and and, and to compare it, which I think um, makes it a little different from a lot of sort of reality follow docs is that we're tying this into this tradition and history and uh, this family pride and and really um, these are salt of the earth American families. I think there's a lot to be learned um, from from studying them actually. Oh, yeah. So as a historian, Dean, you you work, you research to uncover the complete history of events. And it still feels like we don't always use that information to learn from history. We still have some of the same emotional traits that got us into trouble in the first place. You know, you have the, the love and the hate side of things, the revenge, the ambition, power, greed. So why do you think it's important to study history? Yeah, you know those those long term uh, those 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 kinds of um, emotions and, and human traits are not going to go away. You know they they're 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 here for the long term. But I, I do I do think it's important to study history to try not to you know come, you know uh, do some of the, the 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 wrong things we did before that led us down a bad path, and also to um, to analyze what goes on and, and determine what's right and wrong and, and who's right and wrong and, and that sort of thing. So his, history is important. I think we do still, you know, analyze aspects of, of history and come up with lessons that we can can take away. Um, there, there are plenty of lessons to be learned from, from this feud. And then, you know, one of which is that, uh, uh, you know, emotions can get the better of us. 
And if you have conflict, it's always better to step back and to give it some thought and to try to discuss and talk through something when when emotions aren't so hot. So, you know, that's a big initial lesson. Yeah. And so with that in mind, I mean, how did they even get to the place where they were able to sign a peace treaty? They there had to be some of that kind of conversation you're talking about. Well, you know, again, I, I, I mentioned that these are salt of the earth families who who give a, a, a higher proportion of their of their families to the military than a, than a lot of areas. When the when the Gulf Wars were were um, happening, you had Hatfields McCoys who were there, you know, fighting the war. And the Hatfields McCoys came together and said, look, you know, after 9-11, we want to show that. Um, even though the Hatfields and McCoys, you know, have their differences that are feuding, if you attack America, we're coming together. You're fighting both of us. Uh, we're going to be side by side. And and I think they 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 felt that, and they partly um, felt they needed to do that to support their family members who were off fighting the war to show this kind of support. Um, and, and so that big event uh, brought them together to to sign this peace treaty. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So once the war was over, um, they went back to now they've got to defend their own families and keep the well, peace going. I, I'm not sure that ever went away, but um, mm-hmm. the the hostility that had been generated from actual um, murders and betrayals of all sorts back then, they they wanted to bury that hatchet, you okay. know. Um, uh, they're still very proud of their family history and it is a gem of American history. I think, um, even though it's complex and complicated and you wish that, that certain family members had behaved in different ways. I think it is uniquely American. There is a lot to learn from it. Um, I think you can see these, these aspects, uh, of, of their self-reliance and their, um, strong feelings and their, um, desire to stand up for themselves and speak out are all very American type, uh, behaviors. And again, it's something we can look at and go, okay, for better and for worse, you know, um, and it makes us strong people. And we believe what we believe in. We believe, you know, uh, in right and that we're right. But we should also look on the other side and say, are are we sometimes, you know, our feelings too strong? And should we (laughs) learn to compromise in certain situations? And um, and should we put our emotions aside and, and try to talk through things? You know, it doesn't always work. I, I think that the, the next thing you got to learn is that um, if, if you can't do it on your own, you, you need to go get some help. You know, you need to go find the counselors or, you know, the, the moderators in, in the law. And that even went in on back in the day. You know, Devil Lance would go to the to the um, law and, and try to get in the courtroom. And so did Randall McCoy. So these two patriarchs understood that. Um, again, we've We've reduced this, and I think those New York reporters did us a, 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 a disservice when they said these were toothless moonshine and hillbillies. Mm-hmm. These were intelligent people, and they were sophisticated in their own way, and they were ambitious. You know, they they had logging businesses, and they were um, they were uh, you know creating timber that rebuilt the nation after the war, uh, and and so <clears throat> they 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 did work the system when it worked for them often. Uh, and when it didn't, they unfortunately sometimes took, you know, law into their own hands. Yeah. But it also seemed like at the, towards the end of your book, you were talking about several of these people. Um, I, I'm looking at your thing now, your um, get a family chart, but several of them towards the end seemed to start to step back from the violence and the shootings and start to think there was a better way. Um, Devil Ants was one and one of his sons, um, Cap, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Who became yeah. an, a, an attorney. Devil yeah. Ants was, was born again. Um, one of his grandsons would become the governor of the state of West Virginia. Yeah. You know, again, you know, uh, that, that disservice, uh, these were intelligent, ambitious people and they had, um, they had means and uh, the ability to advance themselves. And I think I think all Americans can identify with that. We're a nation of, of immigrants who, um, you know, came here largely to rebuild their lives from from someplace where they weren't doing as well. And they were eager to improve themselves. And I think that spirit has has always uh, been with us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So. 
uh, as we said earlier, one of the takeaways uh, from the book was the moonshine that um, showed up during the elections and moonshine and guns don't mix. Um, but seriously, when when you think about two to three lessons that can be learned from the feud, besides the ones that you've just mentioned, are there a couple more that you think, um, you know, between families and you've talked about a, as Americans, but what about within families and between families? Well, I, I think, you know, um, one thing we, we, we don't see enough of is is uh, an act of generosity of, you know, in, in the feud so much of somebody saying, okay, you did this, but let's, um, we're going to, we're going to take that, but let's move on in, in a positive way. And I think um, it, it almost takes more courage to, um, you know, turn the other cheek. You might be accused by your family of being soft or, you, you know, but, um, and, and it's more rare. I think, I think we need more of that. We can, you know, and, and that could have ended the, the hostility sooner. I think that, you know, we should also think about uh, the the long term. If we can commit a uh, a violent act, the long term repercussions of that um, can go on for generations, and and that's the nature of a feud too. That 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 the initial act is forgotten almost, but the families know they they hate each other. They've been trained to hate each other, and and so there's no way to resolve it anymore. Only because it, it, it all you've got is this passed down conflict and hatred, as opposed to. Um, <laughs> you know, a real reason, uh, something that you could actually sit down and go, well, he here's what happened. Here's what went wrong. And, you know, apologies or, or whatever. So, you know, I think those are, 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 are some lessons. Um, the, the idea that, that, that bitterness and anger can be passed down to the next generation very easily. You know, our, our children pick up on things, you know, if, if aunts and uncles are not, you know, brothers and sisters aren't getting uh, along together. They know their aunts and uncles, you know, and, and that can, it brings divisions to families that um, we have a hard time healing. It just gets harder and harder. We do. And I think it's it's interesting if you can ever sit down with people that you feel like you have everything you disagree about, you find out that there really are things that you can agree on, like you love your own children, you know? Well, so do I. And mm -hmm. you like good food. Well, so do I. So instead of only looking at all of the things that we disagree about, you know, what if we can find a few things that we can agree on and start from there? I don't know. I agree. You know, in, in the case of the, of the feud, um, each family has its own history. And because some of it was what was going on was not legal, it was whispered and it wasn't said out loud and it's sort of passed down and you'll get different versions of each event from each family. Um, and I experienced that when I tried to reconcile them in the book. I tried to look at, okay, here are all the possibilities. Here's what these guys said. Here's what these guys said. And I tried to bring those together and look at the evidence and come up with what I thought was the, the clearest, true history to the story. But it, it wasn't a, it ultimately wasn't uh, uh, something that could please both sides all the time. Yeah, and well, the book was intense mm -hmm. and so much detail. Um I don't know how you kept track of everybody. I really had to take my time <laughs> keeping track of everybody. It's but it's called The Feud, The Hatfields and McCoys, The True Story by Dean King. Um, if you are interested in history and what went on during that feud, I highly recommend this book. Um, and and you will need all of those uh family charts in there to keep track of who's who. Um, if you'd like to connect with Dean, you can check out his website which is deanhking.com. There you'll see all of his books that he's written. And you can also email him at deanhking at gmail.com. So let him know what you thought about this story and other questions. And you can certainly join us on the, the 30th, January 30th, as a Boomer Believer. Um, and talk to Dean one-on-one -on -one within our Zoom meeting. So that will be, go to buymeacoffee.com slash heyboomer0413 and come and talk with Dean and me. And I love it when I hear your comments too. Um, please let me know as you're listening live in your comments, comment on the podcast. Let me know what you liked what you thought I didn't ask that I should have asked. 
Um, you know, always trying to get better at that. And also be sure to support our sponsor, roadscholar.org, by going to roadscholar.org slash heyboomer. So go plan your next trip. Okay, so coming up, continuing on our learning about family dynamics and how to heal broken relationships. My guest next week is Dr. Janet Steinkamp. Dr. Steinkamp is an educator, a teacher trainer, a communication expert, an estrangement consultant, a researcher, and a mom. In conjunction with several professional roles, she spent her career of 25 plus years working with people to develop effective individual and group communication skills, establish healthy relationships, and be confident, successful, purpose-driven people. We will be diving into improving our communication skills within our families. Something that all of us need. <laughs> so to continue to embrace this time of your life with exploration, self-expression, and fulfillment, thank you so much, Dean, for what you shared today. This was a fascinating book and fascinating discussion. Thanks for having me on, Wendy. I enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad you did. Um, I The Hey Boomer show is produced by me, Wendy Green, and the music was written and performed by Griffin Honrado, a student at the North Carolina University School of the Arts, and my grandson.